quick, quick review on what we ended last class with, because what we're going to be uh, studying today is a continuation uh, and the result of that, of what we spoke about at the end of last session. And that is after this long period of persecution, starting from the destruction of the second temple, right? We already went 50 years later of Roman persecution. And then uh, there was the great revolt of uh, Bar Kokhba, which also lasted, uh, it, it, it actually lasted for, for quite a while. He was succeeded by his son. His son was succeeded by his grandson until eventually the Romans came and completely wiped out Betar, which was the headquarter of, uh, of uh, the rebellion. And it was one of the greatest tragedies and massacres that uh, we have suffered. And that's one of the five things that we commemorate on Tisha B'Av, along with the destruction of the first temple and the destruction of the second temple. And then the Romans really uh, took revenge against the Jewish people. And it wasn't enough that they wiped out Betar, they wanted to wipe out Judaism completely. And they had uh, a very terrible uh, Gezerot. Um, no, Nobody is allowed to ordain rabbis, new, new judges to the Supreme Court. Anyone who does will be killed. Anyone who is appointed to the Supreme Court will be killed. Any city where that takes place and will be wiped out completely. And they followed through on all of those threats. And some of our greatest of the Hachamim, such as Rabbi Akiva himself, he too was uh, very, very brutally murdered, along with many other of the Hachamim. And then we get to a period of Rabbeinu HaKadosh, right? Rabbeinu HaKadosh, uh, our saintly or holy rabbi, also known as Rebbe, just like that, Rebbe. Uh, and his name is Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince. He was very, he became very, very good friends with the Roman Emperor. The Roman emperor really liked him. Uh, some legend or rumors have it that uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi even converted him secretly. And that began a period of uh, peace for the Jewish people. Uh, the rabbis are not being persecuted. They are now being respected uh, by the Romans. And that gave birth to a whole new era and a whole new opportunity. All right? And as the time passed, right, from those earlier hachamim until Rabbeinu HaKadosh, meaning through that period of tremendous persecution until Rabbeinu HaKadosh were finally We got to catch our breaths. And he was very, very special and unique in his era. Right? God gave him, like he had the whole package. He had great, great qualities, the personality traits, right? And Hasidut, he didn't really have uh, a strong inclination to to uh, earthly things we'll put it that way so much so that all the hachamim of his generation they nicknamed him Rabbeinu HaKadosh he's not just our uh, rabbi and master we're not just appointing him as the number one among all the hachamim however he is Rabbeinu, right? Our master, our teacher, our number one, HaKadosh, right? The holy, the saint, the, the saintly. 
Vaya Shemo Yehuda, and his name was Yehuda. We said we call him Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Vaya Betachlita Chokma Verum Hamaala. He was also extremely wise. He was the wisest of the Chachamim, and he also was of the highest status, not just status in the court, as in president of the court, but uh, also we call it socioeconomic status. He was very, very rich. And he had a lot of influence. Right? And this is what is uh, quoted in the Talmud. He says, from the days of Moshe, right? Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Moses, until the days of Rabbi Uda Hanasi, we never saw uh, a mastery of the Torah on one hand, and also uh, being a, a, a complete leader and, and of the highest status, on the other hand, in one place, embodied by one person, right? Only, only Moshe, who was also uh, the receiver of the Torah and the transmitter of the Torah, and also uh, functioned as the king, uh, and so the next person who, who lived up to both of those, the way Moshe did, was Rabbeinu HaKadosh. Um, of course, this is, uh, you know, there were other, I mean, David HaMelech was also a king, and he was also president of uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, so we do have others, but this is a way to, to really uh, 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 glorify the name of Rabbeinu HaKadosh, to emphasize how special and how unique he was. Same way that they say about Maimonides, from Moshe, Rabbeinu, mi Moshe ad Moshe, from Moses to Moses, right? From Moshe Rabbeinu to Moses Maimonides, right? Lo kam ke Moshe. There was nobody else who was as great as Moshe. Of course, there was also, you know, David HaMelech, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, all these other people along the way. But, you know, it's a nice praise to give to someone like Moshe Rabbeinu, who really, uh, or uh, sorry, to the Rambam, who uh, really passed down the Torah Shabbat We'll learn about that later. So the same way they uh, gave nice praise to Rabbeinu HaKadosh, uh, uh, comparing him to Moshe Rabbeinu. Vihaya, by the way, it's interesting because uh, the both, people, both these figures who are compared to Moshe Rabbeinu, um, actually... Uh, Maimonides, who was compared to Moshe Rabbeinu, was descendant of Rabbeinu Akadosh, who was also compared to Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and none of them are actually descendant of Moshe Rabbeinu, though. Right? And he was very, very humble, which is also a, a nice comparison to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu says, right, Anav uh, Adam, he was most more humble than any other man. So he says Rabbeinu Akadosh too. He was extremely humble. The Shiflut Aruah. Right, and he steered away from his uh, inclinations. As they said, right from the day that Rabbeinu Hakadosh passed away, there is no such thing as a humbleness and fear of. Uh, it's as if, uh, uh, along with the Rabbi, went humbleness and uh, fear of sin. All right, again, a nice praise just to emphasize how great Rabbeinu HaKadosh was in the eyes of all the other hachamim in his generation. In addition to all that, right? When we see, he had extremely he was a very great linguist and he knew Hebrew very, very well. Why is this so important? This is the land of Israel. Everybody knows Hebrew, right? Everybody knows the uh, proper grammar. Uh, I mean, you'd expect all the Chachamim to. But we see that one of the big challenges that uh, the men of the great assembly had to deal with was uh, incorrect Hebrew. Right, we see in the book of Ezra, Ezra came back from Babel, right? And Nehemiah came back from Persia. They came, the book of Ezra 
uh, describes, says uh, about the Jewish people coming back, right? They speak half Hebrew and half and they speak Ashdodit, uh, like from Ashdod, uh, kind of like uh, basically saying they're mixing their Hebrew with a foreign language. All right? And that is why on Sheik Neset HaGidolah, they prescribed a precise formulation. They formulated the prayers for us. Right? Up until then, there was no official prayer, right? When you go to pray Shaharit or Minha or Arvit, you know, you open up a Sidur and you read what it says. Up until then, everybody just uh, spoke and prayed from their hearts. It was on Sheikh Neset HaGidola who, who, who formulated the Tefina because people didn't know how to express themselves properly. Or they'd express themselves half in Hebrew and half in a foreign language. You're allowed to pray in a foreign language, right, if you don't speak Hebrew. But it says, let's just put the words together properly, uh, make a nice formulation so that people can... Uh, you know, as they learn Hebrew, understand it better, maybe also help them improve their Hebrew. But we'll have a, a proper, uh, uh, we'll have a prayer to God in proper language, right? When you go to address uh, the president, uh, right, of the United States, you go to address Congress, you want to speak to them in a proper language. You're going to go speak to a king, you want to address them with proper grammar. You want you want someone to really go over your speech first, right? Uh, and to correct it. So this is what Anshay Knesset HaGidullah did. And Rabbeinu HaKadosh, he was an expert in the Hebrew language. Yoter Mikol Adam, more than anybody. To the point, Ad she'ayu ha'chamim alem ha'shalom lo meddin bi'ur minim she'nistabku lahem bilshon ha'mikra Right? He was so he was so expert in Hebrew, and he was also a great teacher, that the Hachamim at his time, if they had any question of what is the meaning of a certain word in uh, scripture, right? The reading of Pasuk, right? I I made you an Amir. What does that mean? The word Amir. It's not common in the Hebrew language. All right? So maybe today we'll go look at some other translations, maybe compare it to Aramaic or Arabic, similar languages to try to figure out what it means. In the times of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, they went to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi to ask him. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, he's the president. He doesn't have uh, too much time. Uh, so his servants and his slaves would say, uh, well, what is it that you need? He said, well, I'm studying Torah, and I came across this word, and I don't know what it means. I said, oh, well, I'll tell you what it means. Right? His slaves, we're talking about the lowest socioeconomical level, serving Rabbi Uda Hanasi in his house, and they... Uh, they learned from him so much of the Hebrew language that the Hachamim, when they had a question, it was enough for them to just ask their servants and slaves of Rabbi Uda Hanasi, and they were able to interpret the scripture for them. And this is one of the uh, more uh, well-known things in the Talmud, that... Uh, you know, all these virtues of Rabbi Yudha Nasi and his mastery of the Hebrew language. He says, and he was so rich and he had so much assets that they said about him that the fortunes of uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Yudha Nasi, were greater than that of the King Sevor, who was, I don't know much about King Sevor, but apparently he was a very rich king.
Vilachin, and therefore, because of all these virtues and his mastery of the Hebrew language and his tremendous wealth, Vilachin Hitiv Lahachamim Vilatalmidim. Right? So he benefited from all his knowledge and all his wealth to the Hachamim and to their students, right, of his generation. Very best Torah be Israel. And he taught Torah throughout the nation, the Jewish nation, and he took advantage of this era of peace. Right? So throughout these past generations, we say that the students, they couldn't complete properly all their uh, all of their education, not that uh, they didn't master whatever we received in tradition, but any new question that arose caused tremendous uh, disputes between the Hachamim. And the Hachamim would, you know, so you have one school that teaches this way, and another school that teaches another way. And the Biuda Hanasi, he was in the position and under the circumstances of his generation, he was able to collect all of the different interpretations and all of the different opinions, right? He was able to go into the National Archives all the way back to the days of Moshe, until his days, and he was able to collect everything. And he himself, right, he was part of the tra the chain of tradition, and he received the tradition from the days of Moshe that was passed down one generation after another, all the way until him, right, Right, he received Torah from his father Shimon, who received Torah from his father Gamliel, who received the tradition from his father Shimon, who received from his father Gamliel, who received from Shimon. Right, you remember the chain of uh, Shimon bin Gamliel, Gamliel bin Shimon, Aban Shimon bin Gamliel. Right, it all started with Hilen, right? Who was uh, who was the 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 president of the court in the times of Shammai, right? Hilen and Shammai, and they and he received from Shimbaya and Avtalion, his masters, his teachers, presidents of the court, and they received right from Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shattach. And they received from Yeshua ben Pirahiya, Vinitai Harbini. Remember now we are going through the five generation period of the pairs, Mi Yoseb ben Yoazer, Vi Yoseb ben Yohanan, right? Another pair, Mantigonosh is Soho, who received from Shimon at Sadiq, who was the end of the man of the great assembly, and Sheikh Inesit al Gidullah, who received from remember he was at the time of Alexander the Great, when Alexander the Great came to Eretz Israel, and he received from Ezra, was uh, the beginning of Anshei Knesset HaGidola, who returned from Bavel, Nefi Shehu Mishare Anshei Knesset HaGidola, the Ezra received from Baruch Ben Eria, who is mentioned also in the Bible, which is the student of Yirmiya Hanavi, Baruch Ben Eria is is considered to be like the end of the Nevi'im along with Ezra. Uh, the last of the, the actual, uh, called the Nevi'im, uh, the main Nevi'im was Yirmiyah, Jeremiah. Uh, right? And Yirmiyah received from the previous Nevi'im that came before him, right? We've already seen uh, previously the chain of tradition how it went through the times of the Nevi'im, and he's not specifying here. Nevi mipi Nevi, ada zekinim, shekibilu mi Yehoshua, right? One generation of prophets from another generation of prophets who received from the elders, who was like Pinhas, right? Who received from Yehoshua, who received from Moshe. So all this is coming to show that 
other than his tremendous wealth and his mastery of the Torah and his wisdom and his high status and his uh, exceptional virtues and his mastery of the Hebrew language, he is also uh, one of the key figures of uh, people who received the tradition uh, one generation after after another, going tracing it back all the way to Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, any questions so far? Questions, comments? Yes, Michaela. So this is not completely tuned into the, the the lineage of of prophets and 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 all of these sages. But I was just wondering because you mentioned uh, Yehuda Nasi. Um, uh, you mentioned the Shaharis, the Misha, the Mahari, or so, or, or is it only the Shaharis, the Misha, and the Mahari that is considered prayer? So I, I, and I then personal that. prayer. You can't hear me? <laughs> no, no, I heard you. Just uh, there was something I, I couldn't hear you say. Okay, I was just wondering what is considered prayer? Is it only the Shaharis, the, Ma, the Misha, and the Mahari, or and personal prayer, of course? Uh, or is it like the bed, the bedtime Shema? Is that also considered a prayer? I I just thought that I since you brought it up, I could okay. ask you. Okay. All right. It, it's 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 not really part of the class, but uh, I'll explain it briefly. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'll explain it briefly. No problem. Um, the main when 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 you talk about tefillah, it's it's really the Shemona Yisrael. That is the tefillah. Besides that, there's also there is also a misvah to do Kiryat Shema. And, and, and part of the misvah of Kiryat Shema includes the blessings that we say beforehand and the blessings that we say afterwards. There's also a halakha that you should say them together, right? So you do Kiryat Shema, you start with the blessings before, Kiryat Shema, the blessings after, and then you move on to the Shemun Aisri. That is the heart of the tefillah. No, tefillah is prayer. Yes, sorry, the tefillah yeah, is okay. prayer. Now, okay. That is the heart of the prayer, and and that is really what we. Uh, that's the requirement of uh, of prayer. Besides that, um, there's all these other psalms, uh, tehinim, all sorts of piraki, uh, chapters of tehinim uh, that uh, Chachamim added before. That they also they put together. Uh, it's kind of like an orchestra. It's kind of like a show, right? Where everybody stands up and they say Baruch Sheamar, and then they go on until they and they put a whole set, a whole. They organize the prayers for when you do it in public, so it'll be uh, also you know spiritually uplifting, especially if you have a nice hazan with a nice voice who knows how to sing the prayers properly. Um, um yeah. So the psalms don't count as they're not psalms are don't count as they don't count as blessings. Sorry, psalms. Uh, to heal him. Yeah. They don't count as brachot. Well, well, they're not brachot. Brachot are blessings. Chachamim they instituted certain blessings, like when you eat an apple, say borefiri ayes. Right when you do kiddush, so you say borefri agefen and say shakidshanu. Right, or would you do a misvah before you perform a misvah? You say shakidshanu the misvah of sevanu. Right, al mikra megila or whatever it is. Uh, Psalms isn't one of that. Um, Psalms are the how do you call it? It's it's like poetry of David Amenek, and and they're very spiritually uplifting as well, and they're meant to. Uh, they're meant to arouse your neshama. They're, they're meant to, uh, what's the word? You know, uh, uh, give you, forgot the word in English. Um, but, but they're meant to elevate you. Elevate you spiritually and uh, not just spiritually, but but emotionally. Emotionally attach you to, to Akadosh Baruch Hu. And so that's why 
Our tefillah includes a lot of that. If you're stressed with time and you don't have time to say, you know, everything in shaharit and you want to say tefillah, then, you know, it's shmona That That's it, really. Right? Uh, you, you wake up early and uh, waking up early, that's, that's the best time to say when the sun rises. As the sun rises, to say shema. That's the best time to say shema. But I don't know, you can't really, you don't have enough time right now to say Shema and pray. You, you pray later. Okay, that's also fine. All right. And anything else? Or anything on uh, questions on what we studied so far? I would like to ask for the names uh, you have just cited. Yirmiyahu, uh, if you can explain why is this added okay. Yahu? It's uh, it's the same. It's the same person, right? We see in uh, different eras, uh, the names were slightly different. Uh, some books will call him as Yirmiyah and some as Yirmiyahu. Uh, we see that with a lot of names. There are different eras where certain names were more common or certain ways of pronouncing a name were more common than others. But uh, there is no real difference between Yirmiyah and Yirmiyahu. Okay, thank you. Yeah, pleasure. All right, so we'll get back to Igeret Rav Sherira Gaon, right? The end of the Geonim, the Gaonic period. We'll understand more about them later on. Uh, and, he, uh, and he comes to elaborate a little bit more on this era. He says, Ubechola Shanim Haele, and during all of these years, Nidbaru Kolha Lachot Shayu Tenuyot Bechol Bateh Midrash, right? All of the different halachot and teachings from all of the different. Um, schools we said each uh you know there, there was a time where there were many disputes between the hachamim whenever they'd arrive you know uh arrive at a new question and they, they they would start to discuss and analyze and a lot of disputes would come up and so different uh courts and different batei midrash right yeshivot they would uh teach in a certain way and during these years of Rabbeinu HaKadosh, this was a time to uh, get to the bottom and decide Halakha is going to be like who? And put an end to this developing development of many different Torot. Right? All this is a consequence of uh, the great loss that occurred to us during the destruction of the temple, right? And the persecutions and, and things were getting lost. The temple was burned down. A lot of the national archives were in the temple. So a lot of things also may have been lost. The sefekot, right? And all the doubts, the questions that they had in halakha, shayu lahim be'otama mehumo, during all of those uh, times of the persecutions. So now is an era to restore everything that we lost. Right, and everything from the time of the destruction of the temple, right, through Khorban Betar until Rabbi Udahanasi, right, all of the Mahlokot that uh, which, that arose during that time, nifseka halacha, right? So Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, that was the point of the Mishnah, he's the composer of the Mishnah, uh, he, want, he had a mission to set the halacha, one for everybody. Put an end to all of these mahlukot between the hachamim. Benehem divrei yehidim ve harabim, Right, and among them there are the opinions of the few and the opinions of the majority. He wanted to put everything forward in front of everybody, gather everything, and make a pesach halacha. Ahare yagu ha'chamin b'hem 
יגיעות רבות ודקדקו בהם ביתר שאת. Right? This is after the Chachamim of his generation started, even it started actually with Rabbi Akiva and his students. Even during the times of the persecution, they put a lot of effort into um, writing up their memoirs, we'll say, or their notes on the Torah Shed Be'al Peh. And during this time of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, they were able to, uh, 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 call it, to make them more accurate. Right? Because, you know, someone's writing notes. When you write notes, they're not 100% accurate. Because you're, you're writing notes for yourself, mostly. But then, when you want to prepare it as uh, teaching material, then you need to really, uh, uh, you need to edit it, and you need to make it accurate. And, you know, what, what, what did he mean over here? And because we have this other halakha that says something else. And, okay, so... Let's, let's change a bit uh, the wording, right? Let's make it more precise. And so they would analyze very, very deeply, uh, very succinctly every single uh, 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 tradition that was written down. The Mishnayot and, and, and the Halachot, which we called the Mishnah afterwards, to make them very, very... Um, to make them very precise and proper uh, in order to supply the students with proper uh, educational materials. And they didn't add anything new, right, that wasn't already uh, stated by the people of Anshek Neset HaGidola. Right? So we're talking about these generations. From Anshek Neset HaGidola to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So Rabbi Akiva and his students, they're going through this huge project of, of uh, 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 writing up notes. And later in the times of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, they're trying to make them accurate and turn them into teaching material. Right? And so they would sit down in discussions and they would analyze with each other uh, until they uh, were satisfied that they have no more uh, no more doubts on what the Chachamim, the previous Chachamim said. Right? What did they mean when they wrote this note? Right? It was like to that degree of analyzing the notes of the previous Chachamim to really uh, make a comprehensive picture of the opinions of all the Chachamim in order to make a Pesach Halacha. Okay? I know this is a bit, uh, it's a bit complicated and a bit messy, but life, especially at that time, is very messy. And... Uh, in the army, we used to say, you know, uh, we saw them, we'd go to our commanders and we'd say, uh, what am I going to do with this jacket? It's, it's got a tear in it, right? My, my, my thing isn't working well. And they said, this is what we have, and this is what we're going to win with. We, we, we do with what we have. We make the best out of whatever situation we're in. And they... They were suffering tremendous persecutions and they did their best until we got to the times of Rabbeinu HaKadosh where they were finally able to put this all this material together and, and try to figure it out, make sense out of it and make something comprehensive to teach to other students. Right? And so now they can say, uh, you know, they're gathering all the notes and they're putting things together, and the Chachamim now, they know what are the things that everybody agrees on. Uma she'esh bu machloket, and what are the things that are disputed among the different Chachamim. And this is what the whole Talmud is about. When you're studying Gemara in Talmud, it's, it's trying to figure out what this Chacham really thinks. And if it's a machloket with another chacham, 
Umaula Yahid, Umaula Rabim. And what is a majority opinion and what is uh, a minority opinion? Right? Because until then, they didn't have any uh, official text that they can rely on. Everything was passed down orally from generation to generation. And then they started writing notes that wasn't an official publication. It was personal notes. And so they had no common text to compare to. Right? That everybody recites, you know, uh, with the same formulation and the same text. Only the reasoning of the halakha was what was common to everybody, right? And the masorit, right? What was passed down from generation. So they knew the reasoning of halakha, and they knew, uh, and they knew uh, uh, um, the traditions that they received. And that was what was the common denominator for everybody to go back to and to analyze all of these notes that they're collecting based on it in order to figure out what is every uh, hacham's rabbi's opinion. And even though all of the Chachamim, right, they all agreed on the same principles, we'll call it, and the traditions. Every uh, teacher would teach his students in his own language. So there was never a common uh, formulation of the oral law. They had the reasoning and they have the knowledge. But when they teach it, each teacher teaches it in his own way. Right? Some, some would be very brief. They would say one sentence or one paragraph and that was their way of teaching. Right? Some would say general rules. In a general rule, and others would teach by giving very specific examples, and th that was his way. And then, and then you can, you know, if you're the kind of person who thinks in generalities, so you'll extract the general rule from that. If you're the kind of person who thinks needs specifics, so but your teacher teaches in general in, in general rules, then you'll need to deduct deduce. The 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 uh, how do you call it uh, the specific case from these general rules. Every person has their own style. Every student has their style, and every teacher has their style. The yes, and there are those and there are others who tied their teachings into uh, the thirteen midot that we mentioned earlier. Right, Gizera Shava or Kladufrat. We call a had me hachamim shana bederek shini medorebo. But every one of the hachamim, right, they received a certain style of teaching and they were accustomed to a certain style of teaching that they learned from their teacher, from their master. By the way, this is how it went back all the way to Moshe. This isn't just now, this was always. But now the hachamim need to. Uh, they need to, uh, um, you know, gather all of it and make sense of all of it. Right? One starts teaching Yilchot Shabbat, right? And the other starts teaching Yilchot Yom Tov. And one will say, wait, you can't understand Yilchot Yom Tov if you don't understand Shabbat first. And the other says, no, we'll teach Yilchot Yom Tov, which is lighter, and then we'll go on to Yilchot Shabbat. Right? So everybody has their own way. One is brief, and the other one, uh, you know, he, he, he expands a lot more on, on certain subjects. 
right? And when Rabbi Yudah Hanasi saw that all of these notes um, uh, between the Chachamim are so, so different in style, even though the reasoning behind the halacha, right, and and the Kabbalot, the, the, the traditions, they all point to one thing, right? So he was he was concerned. He was concerned that you can't teach from this material. Right, because this was a time previously of great hachamim, and during the persecutions, you can't really raise a proper wise man during times of persecution, because first you need to worry about not getting killed, and then you need to worry about uh, having enough food, and then you need to worry about you know shelter. And when are you going to sit down to study Torah? And so you can't really generate true wisdom under these conditions. Some of it was preserved. However, now when the times of Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, even though it was a time of relative peace, he knew that's not going to last forever. The persecutions are going to continue at some point. And, and he was right. And so he's afraid that, you know, we have this mess of all these texts. And if the students, right, and the future students aren't going to be able to uh, make sense of them because they're going to be too busy running for their lives, then that, that could be a, a very serious problem for the Torah. It, it, it may come to an end. Right, and because he said that so basically wisdom is is dwindling over time, except for that sweet spot that he lived in. So he said, This is what they say in the Talmud. If the earlier Hachamim are comparable to angels, we are human beings. Right, and if you want to compare them to uh, uh, human beings, right, then we are as uh, donkeys uh, in our wisdom compared to them. Right, and also a similar statement by Rabbi Yohanan. In tractate Iruvin, he says the heart, the heart is always associated with wisdom. The heart of the earlier scholars, the earlier Hachamim, is as an opening of, of a hallway, Vishin Aharonim, sorry, as a as as, as a huge uh, how do you call it? Uh ulam is like a, a huge hall. Okay? Vishin Aharonim and the later ones, right? So their wisdom is comparable uh, by comparison to the opening of a hallway. We made it be. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so I'll continue. We made it be Yashivu Hachamim Laveta, right? But now we will see we arrive at the times of Rabbi Uda Anasi again. Right and the hachamim, they are safe and they are secure. The loyta gezera, and there was no persecution of the hachamim during his times. Mipneha avash aita ben Antoninus verebi. Right, because of the tremendous uh, uh, love between the Rebbe Yudah Hanasi and uh, Antoninus, who we said was uh, he was the emperor of the Romans then at the time. Right, and all the hachamim, they uh, agreed to uh, organize now the halachot, everything that was that developed over the last years, and basically uh, organize, basically organize the mess that uh, developed over the time. 
כדי שילמדו החכמים אותן פה אחד ולשון אחד. This was for the purpose that they'll have a, a one official text that everybody can refer to and study. Everyone studies one official text. So now when they're having a discussion, they're not discussing some note that one rabbi wrote from, uh, that was part of one school of thought and the other one another one. No, now they're all going to be discussing the same text. One agreed upon formulation. Right, and so that everybody doesn't learn and teach in their own specific style right? the previous Chachamim before the destruction of the temple they didn't need any of this right? because this is an oral law it's passed down orally and most of the time up until then up until the destruction was times where the Chachamim could actually uh, uh, develop and teach and they didn't have any set formulation which they would teach the same way that you would teach the written Torah. Right? The written Torah, there is no dispute on the text. Everybody refers to the same text. Right? When when the rabbi or uh, comes to give a speech at Shabbat about Parashat Shavua, he's quoting the same text that a different rabbi is giving in a different show. They may each be saying completely different ideas, but they're all basing themselves on the same text. <laughs> Excuse me. This didn't exist with the oral law. It was always passed down orally. But now, this but now, um, due to certain these circumstances of us going into exile and uh, all the persecutions, they want to make sure that there's some sort of common base, common text that everybody can refer to. Right? And all the reasonings of the halachot was... Obvious to them, uh, as if they received it from Sinai. We're talking about the earlier Chachamim. And as we said earlier, they didn't have any disputes in between them. And if they had a dispute, it was a minor dispute, and it was quickly settled in court. So Baraita in Aramaic actually means external, right? So all of these writings that they gathered. Or that developed. Vitosefta. These are just different names of different compilations of the different Chachamim. Vesifra. Vesifre. Right? Another another two different books. Hem Asher Kvar Limedum Kulam Otam Chachamim Arishonim. Right? So we get the times. This all started with the times of Rabbi Akiva, where they started gathering all of these, all of these uh uh, uh, notes and putting them together into many different books. Each book was compiled by a different person. They each had their own compilation. And these are three students of Rabbi Akiva who came and collected uh, whatever they can find and, and put them in their own book. Each one collected his own Right, his own set of his own collection of halachot. One of them is called Tosifta, and that was put together by the Bnei Hamia. Another one was Sifra, what we mentioned before, by the Biyuda, the Sifre, by the Bishimon, or Matnitin. There's another one, the Mishnah, which is mostly quoted in the Mishnah, is by the Bimeir. He's also one of the more famous ones of them. We spoke about him previously that he was ordained. By Rabbi Akiva, if you remember, when he was young, and the Chachamim didn't really accept it because he was too young, and then Rabbi Yehuda came and ordained him again uh, at tremendous risk to his own life, uh, ordained him again, and everybody accepted it. 
Vechunam Nefir Bi Akiva. Right? And all of these compilations, basically the entire Mishnah, and this is why I say Judaism as we know it today is all according to Rabbi Akiva. Because the Mishnah was based on these texts, and these texts were gathered by the students of Rabbi Akiva. They're all in according to the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, because they were his students. And so, basically, everything we study today in the Halakha is really according to Rabbi Akiva and his students. And Hachamim, who didn't participate in this huge project, um, if they had a different opinion, there was no one to record it and to represent it in the Mishnah. Uh, I think we'll stop here for today, and tomorrow, uh, next week, we'll already finish this section. Um, it was a lot, I know, a lot of information. Um, what I think is just most important to realize is, one, you know, times of persecution aren't just uh, a physical disaster to the Jewish people but they are also a spiritual disaster and they destroy the Torah on the other side of that coin is that times of peace or times at least when we're in power and when we're in control of our destiny are times where we can take advantage of to recover and restore all that damage that was done. And this was the opportunity that Rabbi Yudha uh, Nasi, in a way, created. He created this opportunity by being in such great relations with the Roman Empire. And he took advantage of that time to, uh, to really restore the mess that generated uh, over these past few generations. And basically, Judaism as we know it today is a result of Rabbi Yudha Hanasi taking advantage of this era, this short era of peace for the Jewish people in a long period of tremendous persecution. Uh, that's really what saved Judaism for the past 2,000 years. Um, any questions? Um, so, uh, how reliable is the Mishnah considered by different like groups? Because, uh, yeah, because from what I understand, it's considered uh, fully reliable or fully uh, the proper oral Torah. Okay, that's 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 a good question. Uh, I don't know if I would use the word reliable. Um, in the end, all matters in Jewish law, if, if you remember, what was the birth of Jewish law was consent. All right, we entered, we freely contracted a covenant with God, right? God approached us with an offer. And we accepted that offer. And we accepted the Torah through Moshe because we appointed him to represent us. God also appointed him to represent himself to us. So um, what's most important, and this is really where the Mishnah derives its... Uh, what derives its authority is that all the hachamim eventually accepted it upon themselves as the official teachings. So it doesn't even, I mean, I would say it's extremely reliable in its recordings and how it records the tradition. But to me, that's secondary. The primary concern of the Mishnah 
is that all the Chachamim accepted it. And that's why it's uh, it, it's valid till today. That is the one uh, piece of literature of Hazal, of the, of, of the Chachamim in his time, that received consensus by all the other Chachamim. 